This week's guest for Right Here in Mass is Kristen Elworthy. Kristen is the founder of the PR agency Seven Hills Communications, built on the premise that marketing and PR can be affordable ways to boost a brand image. She believes in a clear strategy that's also flexible and in working with her clients in the ways that make the most sense for them. Kristen has worked in corporate marketing and in the PR agency world. Her journalism background makes her particularly equipped to help businesses tell their stories in, across a variety of channels. Kristen, thank you so much for coming on the show. Please share more you. about you and what you do. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. So um, for the past 13 years, I've been um, a PR consultant and then uh, in the last three or four a small agency. Um, we focus mostly on female-founded, mission-driven brands um, and personal brands at, and companies and some nonprofits. Um, and we um, we do have lots of local, you know, we're based here in Boston. So we have lots of Boston based clients, um, but we also, uh, we have national reach. So we work with companies all across the country, um, literally both posts and everything in between. We have a great company in Wisconsin, for example. So it's always fun to hear, to be able to go into those different markets. Um, but we do have, we have a strong kind of affinity for our Boston people. Very fun. And you have an interesting background in both journalism and PR. So could you explain what made you want to pursue both and then what encouraged you to start your own agency? Yeah, sure. So right, I, I you know, went to college, I majored in PR, um, in communications um, and left and did some marketing, worked in marketing at some tech companies. Um, I went actually back to grad school and I got a master's degree in journalism um, and I worked in local papers um, for a short time. Um, I actually worked in a couple of documentaries as a sort of a production assistant um, working on the story piece of it. Um, and and those were great. I love telling stories, um, but I do have a little bit more of like a business sort of mindset than uh, a lot of journalism, at least back then. So we're talking about 2007 or so. Um, than a lot of journalism careers would would allow for. I think journalism now actually is very entrepreneurial. Um, and there's, if you're smart about it, um, you know, they have lots of journalists have their own platforms and their own ways of monetizing their work. But back then it really was, you know, you get a job in paper or whatever, and you kind of climb up through the ranks that way. Um, so I wrapped a project. Um, I was looking for a job in PR, going back to an agency. I'd worked at an agency for a short time. Um, and I started doing some freelance work. And when you're, I was in my late twenties at the time. So when you're in your twenties, PR is not the most lucrative <laughs> of careers anyways. Um, so it didn't take long to sort of replace my salary that I would have been making, um, with freelance work and just, we sort of just built from there. So for many years, I was a consultant, um, and, and a freelancer. Um, I had three kids in that time period. So it's sort of ebb and flow, the amount of work I had or the team I had with you know, what was going on with me. Um, and then about four or five years ago, started sort of building a team um, and created more of an agency model. Mm. So what made you want to switch from being a freelancer to building out an agency? Yeah. So, I mean, everyone else uh, probably who's in this position has felt this at some point you hit capacity, right? So mm -hmm. um, there's lots of great things about being um, a contractor or a freelancer and only having yourself to answer to, I think. Um, but one of the not great things is that, you know, you hit a, you hit a ceiling and if you're not doing the work, you know, no one else can do it either. Um, so, and also at some point, you know, it's nice to have other perspectives. That was the other piece of it. So it felt like, um, you know, having other perspectives on, um, the clients on the journalism world, just like having other people to talk to about things, having other people to put muscle behind things at some point, that was just a natural extension of where we were going with clients. So it was a little bit of both. I um, mean, it was very organic. It was that we had contractors on the team that were working and eventually, you know, those people got more turned into full and part-time employees um, and became more integral part of the team. So I'm, I've been lucky in the fact that it's grown very organically and really comfortably for me. Um, to be able to have a team that like understands where we come from, like where the mm -hmm. clients are coming from and all that stuff. I love that. So now that you've built out a team, are you still kind of focusing a lot on the day-to-day -day stuff with pitching clients yourselves or like, what's your role now that you've grown? Yeah. So everybody pitches. Um, that is the one thing that that includes me. So when we work with contractors or bring in um, people that are a little more senior, I always say like, we all pitch. Like, I think it's a muscle you have to use. Um, so my day-to-day -day role is more on the strategy side for sure, but I'm still on, you know, most of our client calls, um, with our, our teams, depending on how, how the client is set up, um, just working through the day-to-day -day in many ways, um, supporting the team when they're stuck, 
right? Everyone gets stuck sometimes mm. brainstorming, offering sort of some perspective. Lots of times, because I've been doing this so long, I immediately like, I know who we need to pitch for this story. Like, here's the information, like, here's how we need to angle it. So lots of that coaching and guidance. And my goal is to really get, you know, the members of the team comfortable doing that on their own and sort of helping them to be able to do it as well. But I definitely get in there and pitch all the time. Um, with a lot of our clients, I am the main point of contact and the main person doing outreach for them. And then there are others where there are a couple of team members on it um, that, you know, have some great, that do great work in the consumer space or the baby space. So we sort of divide and conquer based on strengths. Oh, that's perfect. And I imagine one of the benefits of building out a team in PR is that everyone comes with their own contacts that they have for different journalists or publications to use. For sure. Yeah. So one of our, the, one of the interesting things we do with our model, which is why it's a micro agency and I'm not going to be growing like a really big kind of traditional agency. We do have this core team, um, but we bring in contractors on that have specializations. So mm -hmm. if we're working on a client that's in the digital health space, or we're working on a client um, you know, that is in the baby space um, and we need to staff it with more people, we'll look for somebody that has that background and expertise and some of those contacts. Um, my caveat always is I, I am, and most like PR people who have been doing this a long time and have been through rounds of layoffs and everything else, story is way more important than contacts. So to me, mm. finding people who understand story, tell a good story, et cetera, and can pitch that story, that's key over just saying, you know, I know somebody, the best stories I've gotten have been totally cold um, pitches. Um, so, you know, there is a, there's always that, that's something you learn. Everyone thinks it's who, you know, but actually it's the story you're telling in the end. Yeah. And that's a great point. Yeah. And so um, with being able to focus on that, would you say that you have, like, I know you're a micro agency. Do you think that you might grow a little bit more? Or do you think you feel really good about where you are right now? Yeah, we, we've grown really organically so far. Um, I think we'll probably grow a bit more. Um, but all that depends. I mean, we're in an interesting year for our businesses, I think. So, um, you know, we've, I've been just watching what's happening, making sure that we have the staff to um, work with our clients, but also, you know, aren't going out over our skis on anything. So that's why the, the flexibility of having this sort of model where you bring in contractors, we have like a trusted sort of group that we work with. Um, that are always happy to like jump in on clients and know our process. So that's been really successful so far, but certainly like as we grow, um, you know, organically, I could see adding another team member or two. Amazing. And mm -hmm. I imagine that with your dual background in both journalism and PR, being a journalist probably really helped you because you were working likely with publicists. And so you got both ends of the spectrum ultimately. Yeah, so I was a I was a very traditional daily local newspaper journalist. So not as many publicists as you would think for sure, but definitely learning to work with, you know, to like uncover stories. That was the biggest thing. I had to come up with two stories a day every day in a small smallish town, particularly the town I started and I eventually got promoted to like a more exciting <laughs> town, but um but it was small and I remember sitting at my desk some days and being like, "What am I going to, you know, what is there to say two stories every single day?" Um, and it does, it helps you kind of pull out like, what is the real story behind? We would get lots of press releases. Like, what is the real story behind this? Like, maybe this press release isn't interesting, but what is interesting about this? Um, and we try to do a lot of that for our clients too. So when we'll talk, sometimes they'll just be chatting and I'll be like, that. <laughs> Tell me more about that because that's a yeah. great pitch. Um, and then the next piece of it is like, does that pitch fit in with what your overall goals are? Like, does that make sense for you to be talking about, even if you could talk about it? Or like, if it does make sense, how do we talk about it in a way that um, that relates back to like your overall messaging and, and your business goals? So people think of PR as getting that press, but the other big piece of it, it's figuring out what your client is gonna be talking about so that the message is correct when the piece comes out. I love that. And especially that highlights the importance of being able to work with an outside expert who can help you identify that stuff because being in the weeds, some you might view some not view something as exciting or new or fresh or something innovative in the industry that you're in because you're just in the day to day all the time. But someone else will be like, wait a second, like that's different than what other people are doing and we need to talk about it. Right. And that is that's where like, you know, being a good PR partner is on the business side, you know, when you're looking to hire out, whether it's a consultant or whether it's um, an agency, is really thinking about what your stories are and then being willing to listen to what they have to say, find someone who knows your space 
um, so that they can, you know, we've done stuff where it's our first client in a space and we, we are learning it from scratch. You really have to get in there and learn a lot about that space um, to figure out where your client's going to fit into it. Sometimes it's not the way they think they fit into it. Also, sometimes we have to say like, let's really look at this and like, how is it really different? Um, so really starting to think about like what your unique stories are and then bouncing them off of other people. And if you're not at a point of hiring a PR agency or a consultant to do that, there's probably somebody you can talk these things through with. Um, mm -hmm. And just in that, I mean, I know on the social media side, like these things are all consistent. The story you're telling in PR, there's probably some great messaging you can pull out for social and, and all of that stuff. So it all, it all does start to work together. Absolutely. And I want to expand a little bit more on what you just mentioned about people who might not necessarily have the budget to hire someone for PR, but would like to make sure that they're focusing on it. So do you have any tips for someone who is going to be doing it for themselves and how they can do it effectively for the time being? Yeah, I think everyone, almost everyone can do some level of PR on their own when they're starting out. And I think it's smart to try some things on your own and you don't have the budget to hire somebody yet. Um, I find the, the biggest thing people lack is confidence. They feel nervous um, pitching. They don't know if they're supposed to or if they should. Um, I will say my first thing is reporters and podcast hosts, et cetera, love to hear from the person themselves. Not, I mean, they like to hear from us too, but um, there is a different set of standards put on an email that I would send versus an email that you might send as a business owner in terms of like, what the expectation is for exactly how you're positioning your pitch. So first of all, take a little pressure off yourself, right? And then consider the people that you're reaching out to as humans. So write an email. You're not going to want to read five pages. They don't want to read five pages. Um, make it short and interesting. Your job is to get them to reply. I want to hear more. It's not to tell them your entire life story in one email. Um, and the other thing I always say is just be consistent. So start create like a Google document or, um, you know, a Google sheet and start jotting down in your travels, reporters or podcasts or editors, outlets that you feel like you belong in, that your competitors are appearing in. Find those email addresses. They're usually not too hard to, to dig down, to dig up um, or start following those folks on social, appropriately commenting or interacting with their stuff so they start to see you. Um, and then start thinking about pitching them. And, and I, the biggest thing is just, you know, dedicate some time. So the first couple of weeks, you might dedicate a couple of hours a week to building your list and maybe writing a short little pitch so that it's easier to pitch that. You will, well, you'll change it for each pitch, but you have something to grab onto, not like a blank screen. And then maybe it's a couple hours a week that you're saying, I'm going to send out these emails. I'm going to follow up. I'm going to spend a couple of minutes engaging on their content um, to start building that relationship. I think that's great advice, um, and especially because, like you said, just being consistent and maybe doing a little bit of the bulk work up front can really end up playing out for you in the long run. Absolutely. And it depends on the company you are, too. If you're a consumer facing brand that's like a direct to consumer e-commerce company, there are some things you need to have in place you know, to pitch. And so you might want to ask colleagues in that space, for example, you need an affiliate program basically to be featured in national media at this point. Um, and if anyone has any questions about that, they can always <laughs> reach out to me because I, I'm happy to talk about it anytime. Um, but it is, it's a big barrier. People don't understand why they're not getting featured in like the, you know, 50 best Valentine's Day gifts um, feature, even though they've been pitching and pitching and their, their thing is perfect. And Part of it might be you are missing some things that that reporter needs. So in mm. some PR, it's really helpful to have conversations. Like I know I'm always happy to be like, hey, if you're pitching, just like make sure you have these couple of things. You know, I'm not a gatekeeper. So if someone's going to try it on their own, like I'd rather give them kind of the ideas of what they're going to need to be successful because why waste your time? And then you won't feel like PR is successful for you. And that's not helping any of us, So. Exactly. And one of the things that I often hear about from PR people is the importance of building an editorial calendar to know like what's trending right now and to be able to help you find that space where you might fit in. So do you have suggestions on how people can build their own editorial calendar? Yeah. So, I mean, I, we look at holidays, bigger holidays, of, you know, months we're in black history month right now while we're recording women's history month is in uh, March. Um, there's all sorts of tie-ins. Some are stronger than others for press, right? So there are some that you'll see tons of stories about. And then you always see the person that's like really trying to make something of like National Lollipop Day or something. And like <laughs> yeah. you might look out, 
you might look out there, um, but that's probably more of a social media piece. Um, but yeah, just, I would map out, we, as a team, we map out the year. Um, we look at what's coming down the pike um, and might have a potential client tie in. Editorial lead times differ, but I always do remind people it you're, you should be pitching something six to eight weeks before the stories are hitting. So if mothers, mm -hmm. if you go back and look and you're seeing mother's day stories are hitting in the end of April to early May, back up six to eight weeks from that, that's when the pitches are happening. And um, so you really can go back and look at like, when have things been timed before? Um, and then, yeah, look at like those national day calendars um, and sort of just like create an Excel spreadsheet or, or Google sheet or whatever, of what might apply to you, what the date is, um, use it for your email marketing, use it for your social media, and then where it's appropriate, use it for pitches. And, and you kind of know in your gut, like when something is um, you know, going to work or not, but there's lots of things. Like if you're working in the HR space or in the, um, you know, consulting space, like, uh, you know, there's women's equal pay day and things mm -hmm. like that. If you have something to say about some of these issues personally, professionally, totally fine to get out there um, in front of it. Um, more serious, less serious holidays. I would just say, obviously be sensitive, make sure that what you have to say, it's relevant um, and that you're doing it in a way that's like respectful of whatever the holiday is there, you know, occasionally we get, you know, you've seen probably the, the pitches where it's not quite on target. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's great advice. And it reminds me of something once I follow this journalist um, from Adweek on Twitter and she gave like a really great piece of advice that I thought was so interesting, but she said what she prefers when people pitch her, um, if they pitch her for something that could have been, a piece for an article that she just wrote to not share something that's in line with everyone else, but have like a different perspective to it. And I thought about that and I was like, wow, I never would have really thought that. Cause I feel like personally, I'd be like a reactive picture where if I see a story go out about a topic and I'm like, Oh, I can talk about that. I'll send something over. But I think it's a good idea to kind of give a different spin to it. That might prompt them to have another article. 100%. So I will tell you this, journalists use their inboxes like Google, right? So they're looking, if they've written about something once, they might cover it again in the future. We do lots of that, you know, mm. we can't always predict what people are going to write. We'll see something, we'll say, hey, like next time you're covering this topic, just want to make sure this person's on your radar, there's a couple bullets about them. Um, we'll make sure that there's keywords in that pitch. So if, per if someone is, we have like a, um, you know, a DEI consultant on our client roster, um, we will make sure there's certain keywords in that pitch. So if they're searching their inbox for a consultant to talk to next time as an expert, her info will pop up for them. There's lots of that um, happening and that is great advice. And it's okay to pitch after something's been published and to say like, hey, next time you're working on this, like I'd love to talk to you or next time you're doing something like this, my product, like I'd be happy to send you a sample. The one thing I always tell people, do not ask to be included in a story that's already been published because it's <laughs> yeah. definitely not not going to happen. Once in a while, they'll update it, and that's where your pitch comes in, right? So if you're updating mm -hmm. the story next year, would love to get on your radar for it. That's all fine, um, but the ask to be included in something tends to not be received great. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And that reminds me of uh, the mindset of no is different from not right now. So just because a journalist or publication might not include you in the moment, that doesn't mean that three, six, 12 months down the line, they won't come back to you exactly like what you shared. PR is such a long game. I've had, I had a, um, somebody from Boston Magazine years ago came back to me, and I think it was 18 months after I had sent a pitch. And was oh like, I've gosh. been saving this in my inbox. And we actually weren't even working with the client anymore. We sent it over to them. They, they did the feature, which was great. Um, but it just goes to show you, you know, you got to be consistent, consistent without being annoying. Keep coming up with new ways of reaching out. It's a numbers game. And I don't see that in like spam everybody, you know, because it's not a, that's not great PR, but it is about showing up. Like you all have seen the numbers of email, you know, the reports about how many emails a reporter gets, um, how I think the last number I saw is they read 3% of them. Um, so really is showing up being, you know, learning about that person, what they might like. You can follow them on Instagram. You can subscribe to some of their sub stacks and see what they're working on. I mean, there's so many ways to really like catch the opportunities as before they happen. Um, if you're paying attention in your space. Absolutely. And with that, do you have any favorite projects that you've worked on that you're able to share? 
Sure. So since we're uh, since we're on the local um, the local trend, I am going to talk about some of our local clients. So we did we work with New Bedford Whaling Museum, um, mm. which is on the south coast, and we just did PR for their Moby Dick Marathon in um, January, which who knew? FYI, if no one knew that exists, it's a 25 <laughs> hour reading of Moby Dick. Um, we they got some amazing coverage for it, and the best part of it was they had some metrics to share afterwards where they. What we really targeted some outlets that talk to families. Like we did something on Hub Today on NBC, which there's lots of moms watching that. And they had tons more families this year than they ever have had before. And so when we get to see something um, that is sort of like tangible like that, um, that is such a fun pro- and that was like such a fun project to pitch because it p- thousands of people go to this thing. They sleep over in the museum. There's all kinds of fun optics to it. Um, and yeah, and they have like a, they had a celebrity reading um, the woman from Orange is the New Black. Uh, she read the opening passage. Yeah. So it was just a super fun thing to pitch. Um, you don't get a lot of opportunities like that every day because it's, it's a big event for them. Um, so that's always fun. Um, and then we have been able to do some work with like some local breweries and distilleries, which has been really fun. Mm-hmm. So we get to send lots of samples out to folks um, to try and um, have been able to sort of like breathe some new life into some of the events they have, which has been awesome. Oh yeah, that is exciting. And I think like with what I see with the clients that I work with, I feel like I have a deeper connection to the local stuff because there's just that community that's built in it. So I think that's really fun to be able to have the opportunities to support so many local organizations. Yeah, I mean, we're really lucky. We work typically with people on an ongoing basis. So we get to see mm-hmm. them grow over the years in some cases. Um, and so that's been awesome. One other local uh, project, it was just a launch project that we worked on, but I will shout out as Chop Value here that opened here in Boston. They are taking chopsticks and making mm-hmm. them into furniture, recycled chopsticks um, into furniture. Um, Google them, check them out. So it's a local founder. She has got the East Coast franchise of this business. Um, and the process is fascinating. She got tons of local coverage. Um, they, they, you know, everyone loved the story, but the the stuff that they produce is really beautiful. And people were like, wait, like explain it to me. Even me, I was like, explain to me. And they compress those chopsticks. So because I originally was like, like dollhouse furniture, like you're making, how are you? <laughs> yeah. And they're compressing the chopsticks to make a wood composite. So the chance to learn something completely new and then be able to like bring that message out to everybody. I mean, I think she'd rescued like multiple tons of chopsticks from a landfill in like a few months by the time we finished the project so it's just awesome yeah yeah that's amazing and so with the clients that you work with um who might have an industry that you haven't worked with before do you spend like a lot of time beforehand just getting to know them what it is they do and kind of know the ins and outs to help you with your pitching over time yeah so we have a process um you know in place where We look at when we are kicking off, you know, we look at all kinds of sort of more technical things, SEO stuff. We look Mm -hmm. at competitors coverage. Um, We look at, you know, the outlets, if they are a more B2B, we'll look at like trades and sort of what we're seeing there, subscribe to newsletters, start following folks on Twitter. There's not a lot of industries at this point that come to us that we're we're open to working with and we've never worked in before Um, at this Mm -hmm. point. uh, Most of the industries have something in common with, or most of the clients have something in common with other clients that we've worked with. Um, but certainly there's always things to learn. Um, I find it most helpful to read a ton or watch um, a ton of stuff about their competitors because usually um, that kind of gives us a, a good landscape of where everything is at. Absolutely. And for an organization that is ready to begin hiring a PR firm, what would your advice be for them as they start that process? Yeah, so I think, um, first of all, you want to have a conversation with the people on the team that you'll be working with at the um, agency, or if it's a consultant with that consultant and just really ask about, you know, how things will be structured day to day and who you'll be talking to and making sure that you, you know, understand that. Um, so whether that's on zoom or in person, like make sure you like them and that you're going to jive with them because they're going to ask you a lot of questions. Um, you're really going to be handing your brand message over to them to get out there in the world. So make sure you feel confident about what they're, you know, what they're presenting to you and that you feel like they do a good job um, managing that and being a steward of your own brand because you're trusting them to go out there and, you know, start putting it out there. Mm -hmm. Um, I would also say, ask them, you know, who else they've worked with. I always offer up, you know, current and past clients to chat. Um, I don't even probably know half of the things that they think um, in their minds. And 
um, or the challenges with PR. I mean, it is, it's a team sport. We can't do it on our own. So I think talking to other people that that um, agency has worked with, it gives you a sense of like, what's the burden going to be on you? Like, what are you going to need to provide? How often did you have to set time aside for an interview? Did you have to write stuff for them um, in terms of like contributed content? Um, just getting an idea of, um, you know, of what it's like to work with them and whether your business can really handle that. And that's not even necessarily that the agency is or is doing something wrong. Sometimes it's just, you know, there people don't understand what goes into the PR program. And then I always, you know, look at their recent placements, look at other businesses. And that's our, that is our end product is, you know, where we're getting earned media for our clients. Um, so take a look and see if that aligns with what you're looking for. Um, and if that's the type of messaging you're looking for. I love that. And I especially love what you mentioned about the responsibilities of the client as well, because I think that's a big misconception when businesses are ready to hire someone in marketing or PR, they think that it's just pass everything off and they're not needed at all. But we need a lot from them in terms of information and insight stuff, insider stuff that we wouldn't necessarily know in order to make stuff happen. Yeah, it's the difference between success and, and kind of just putting a bunch of generic stuff out there. I'm sure it's the same with social, mm -hmm. right? you can capture a bunch of generic stuff and put it out there and it's fine. Or you can really dig into what the client's unique values are. And that is where usually kind of the magic happens with PR as well. That's where you're able to say something new and different. Um, and I, yeah, I would just say like, make sure you do have the time to invest. It doesn't have to be like tons of time, uh, but just that you're ready to do that. The best question I get and the clients I like, I love to hear from um, are the ones who ask me when we kick off, what can I do? Like, what do you need from us? Because they, I can tell that they understand that, you know, they're going to need to give us something and in, um, in order for us to take what they have and like get it out there to the world. Absolutely. And for anyone who's listening, who might be considering um, switching their careers into PR, what would you recommend for them with getting started? Yeah. So, I mean, there's tons of freelance opportunities available for PR right now. Um, and it can be a little tricky because if you don't have a lot of experience, um, you know, there, there, it's a big, it's a crowded field. Um, I have someone on my team who started with me right out of college and her role um, actually I have two people, one has, one is a little earlier in her career and one's a little later in her career, but her role, um, initially was just like almost like a PR admin, right? So she would build our media list. You would do our media monitoring. Wasn't really anything client facing at the time, but it made my life so much easier. And I knew it would teach her the ropes of like how we put this strategy together. Like, how do we think, how do we figure out who we're pitching? How do we target? And then she ended up growing. Now she's an, um, account executive for us. So she is she has her own clients, she's pitching, et cetera. Um, I think that role is a really good, solid role to start in. And so that's, I don't know, different people might call it a different thing, PR VA, PR admin. But if you can find, you can get 20 hours a week with a small agency or a, even a consultant and say like, listen, I can take list building off your plate. I can take media monitoring off your plate, um, that kind of thing. Like that's great, 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 great foundation. And I imagine that it gives a lot of good background information so that when it does come time to pitch, like you have that process completely down already. Exactly. So for me to be, to say to somebody, Hey, can you build me a media list? I have to be like, here's the client. Here's what they do. Here's the pitch. Here's who I'm looking for. I have to give them so much information for them to be able to build that, to build a good list. Um, so they are learning, like, this is how she's thinking about it. This is how we're going about this. Like, this is, it's, you learn that the, the list is like almost the last step of the pro process. Oh yeah, absolutely. And in addition to the clients that you've worked with, what would you say your favorite local businesses are to support? Yeah. So I, I'm up on the North shore in Linfield and, um, I go four or five days a week to a, um, a gym here called vault training. It's a small group training gym, highly recommended to anyone here on the North shore. It's woman owned. Um, it, it is super innovative the way they sort of move the space around every time you walk in, it's something completely different and new. I also did not know there were treadmills that didn't go for you and you have to push them with your own feet. <laughs> oh my <laughs> so goodness. Like, yeah. So, um, <laughs> so that, um, that is definitely a spot that, um, is like a constant in, and I would, I just want to give her a shout out, uh, Meg, the owner does an amazing job of making everybody feel welcome, which I think is so huge, um, especially in a local business. Um, and then, um, you know, I'm to shout out a couple of my clients, um, but um, they are also amazing local businesses. Exhibit A Brewery in Framingham, which sells all over Massachusetts. 
is an awesome spot um, to grab a beer. They just opened a spot in Common Craft in Burlington. Um, so if you're not in the Framingham area and if you haven't been to Common Craft yet, I highly recommend it. It is so cool. It's in the mall. It is all these different spaces. There's a winery, two breweries, a distillery, like a food spot. So um, oh, wow. awesome. Highly recommend. That'll be my third one. I would, I'd recommend getting down to Common Craft if you can and checking out what they've got there. Awesome. Kristen, this has been such an awesome episode and I really appreciate you coming on the show to talk about all things PR. And now I'd love if you could share with our audience where they can find you online in case they'd like to connect with you further. Yeah, absolutely. So you can connect with me on LinkedIn, um, Kristen Elworthy, just search for me. Um, and on Instagram, we're at Seven Hills Communications. So you can just search for us there. And you can always shoot me an email just like right through my website, you'll find my email sevenhillscommunications.com. If anyone has any questions, always happy to hop on the phone for 30 minutes and do like a little PR AMA and answer any questions I can. Fabulous. And I'll link those in the show notes. That way our listeners can click through and connect with you from there. But thank you so much again for coming on the show. Thank you. Good to talk to you.